Uh, and now we'll move on to the second session, which is about uh, wireless and millimeter wave. And in that session, the first talk is going to be a keynote by Professor Muriel Medard. Uh, so I don't think I need to introduce Professor Medard uh, too much to this group. She is very well known as a leading researcher. She is a professor at MIT and has made fundamental contributions in network coding and reliability. Uh, and you can see her bio is attached to the agenda. So uh, with, with that brief introduction, I'd just like to welcome Muriel. And you have about 30 minutes uh, for your talk. And we have a, a, a little bit of slack after that. So uh, we'll also have time for questions. So uh, please go ahead, Muriel. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you guys all for the uh, for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my slides, and uh, please, hoping that this will work. Everybody, see them? That's good. Fantastic. Um, well, actually, it's uh, it's interesting going. Uh, sorry, I'm having some trouble getting. Uh, there we go. All right. So it's actually it's interesting that that we just had a, a discussion about uh, US EU collaboration because this is very much a US uh, EU collaboration, um, and it's uh, about some interesting uh, new. Uh, developments on the decoding side. And we think it's particularly relevant uh, for ultra low latency reliable communications. So um, the, this is the team uh, at MIT. Uh, it's uh, uh, my Dean, Anantha Chandra Kassam, former postdocs, Kishore Conwar and Janji Lee, current student, Amit Solomon um, at Maynooth University, Ken Duffy, uh, his student, uh, Kevin Galgan, actually we share him as well as we share Amit, uh, and uh, my uh, student, Wei An, and a team at Boston University with uh, Ravi Azizichichil and her uh, students, Baybaf, uh, and Chichun uh, Mandy. Um, so let me, uh, you know, forgive me for just going back to the basics, and I think you'll see why very soon uh, this is really going back to the basics, because what, I, what I'm going to uh, try to convince you is that we should be completely revisiting uh, the notion of, uh, of how, how we do, how we do coding and decoding. So here is what we do. Right. This is what we do as communications engineers. We take data, we compress it, uh, we then uh, channel code it. So we remove uh, we remove basically the uh, uh, the underlying. Um, uh, sorry, somebody. If everybody can go on mute if you're not uh, talking, just because I think there's some clickback. Thank you. Uh, we, we remove the the underlying. Um, uh, uh, redundancy, we then uh, channel code, we add redundancy, we send it through the channel. The channel here you can see does uh, some amount of damage to the data that's transmitted. We decode and then we recover the original data by doing source decoding. Okay, so what's wrong with this picture? Well, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but you know, how do we do this? Well, what do we teach? Uh, you have the source, let's call it S, you compress it down to its entropy, let's call it H of S. Uh, that gives you how much data there is here. So this H of S data over here. You then channel code it, uh, you transform S into X. Uh, this has the same entropy. This is a, a basically roughly a one-to-one one uh, mapping, you then uh, send that uh, down the down the path of um, of your communications channel. Uh, and what does uh, Shannon tell us that the the rate at which you send it has to be suppose that we have a, a binary channel, uh, it has to be uh, one, which would be, you know, basically having uh, having no noise. So th that would be binary full entropy, minus, uh, you have to leave a little room for the noise. So basically, this is the capacity of the channel, uh, and then you're going to send it down the send it down the uh, this channel. You're going to get Y, which is going to be the X, the encoded version of the source S, plus some noise. The noise effect uh, was shown here, and then you're going to decode. Okay, uh, so this this noise here is uh, has this entropy here H of n that you have to to remove 
from basically the, uh, the one, which would be what you would get if you had uh, no noise. So here we have roughly two of the NH strings. That's basically what we're doing by doing the compression. Uh, and here uh, you're only able to send to the NR strings. That's what we mean by rate over here and that's what we mean by rate over there. Okay. So far, so good. This is standard stuff from what we teach, uh, what we teach our first year grads. Um, one of the things to, to remark here, uh, when you look here at, uh, at the channel coding and you look here at the, this notion, uh, this notion of, uh, of rate, is that in effect what we have um, is this, uh, in terms of this, uh, to, to, to this R here, is that what we're leaving the room here for the noise, it means that we're really worried about a noise compression of about two to the NH strings, okay? So that means that really what we're doing here is we leave leaving enough room for the compression of the noise. That's not how we usually consider um, the problem of, uh, of coding over a channel, but that's really what's happening. That's really what's happening uh, with, uh, with capacity. Okay, so now what? What do we actually do when we do transmission, when we do uh, error correction? Well, let's look at the canonical uh, question of, uh, of transmitting over a channel. I shout a message, which is a binary string, say of eight characters. And the noise that we saw before uh, on that little cartoon is going to modify one of the characters as the last character. So how do we go from this back to what was transmitted? Well, if this had been a possible transmission, we're doomed. So basically, if I have a string, binary strings of eight characters and all two to the eight uh, possibilities were, were there, then there's, there's no way that I, could have, uh, that I could have corrected that, okay? So what do I have? Uh, instead, I'm going to transmit a, a code book, and that's, uh, that's where my two to the NR code words, uh, possible code words come in. And I'm going to transmit a code book so that if I look at this and it's not in the code book, I'm going to look for an element of the code book that would have been uh, likely to have been transformed into this uh, receive string. Okay, and that's what Shannon told us is basically how dense can that element of the code book be? Of course, if there had only ever been one possible transmission, then we don't need to worry about it because if there had only been one possible transmission, I would always have found the right code word. On the other hand, I wouldn't have sent any information because it was only one possible code word. Um, so he told us how 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 we could do this uh and you know that has been basically the the basis for a lot of the communication uh engineering that has been done uh over the last uh uh you know half a century or more um what do we actually want okay what is the engineering need uh, the engineering need is we would like to have low delay communications. I don't need to tell that to this crowd. We would like to have low complexity. We would like to have flexibility, flexibility in rate. We would like to have flexibility in block length. And we would like to, of course, be robust to the physical reality of that correlated no of noise, which unlike the N uh, that I showed you in that little cartoon, which is, you know, information theoretically abstracted to be, uh, to be very clean, is actually messy and correlated. I'll show you an example later. Um, what we've been dealing with has been a mathematical model, which really has been reliant uh, on the model that Shannon expounded in 1948. So what does that mean? We tend to look at long codes. Why? Uh, because we look at large end limits. We look at concentration results. We tend to concentrate uh, around large N, and therefore we tend to also think in terms of capacity. Uh, we look at code constructions, and I'll show you an example later. I'll show you a few pictures of typical codes that are very constrained in length and rate. And we tend to think always of the construction of the code as being paired with the construction of the decoder. So we're looking at always code-specific decoders, be it be, you know, majority logic for Reed Mueller, be it um, looking at Reed Solomon with Burley Kemp Massey, looking at, uh, you know, belief propagation for low-density parachute codes or whatever we want. Okay, 
So what are we going to try to do today in this talk? I'm going to try to make uh, the engineering not look like the math, but I'm going to try to make the math look like the engineering. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by making the engineering look like the math? Well, this is what we've been doing all along. If we look at typical channels, we have bit flip probabilities at around 10 to the minus three before, uh, before coding. So this is our raw bit error rate. Um, the channel capacity, therefore, is extremely high. You know, if I look at the entropy of that noise, you know, it's tiny. And so one minus HN means that, you know, the channel capacity is around 0.99. Um, that's not what we're using. Okay, we, we, we have, we have uh, if you look at the 3GPP 5G new radio, the data channel is as these long um, codes, as I mentioned before, with rates which go as long as 0.2, which is miles away from the channel capacity. Um, and, you know, maybe as high as 0.91, but very seldom used. Uh, we interleave like crazy. So basically we have our delays are terrible, why? Um, well, because we interleave over thousands of bits, and on top of that, we interleave over very long code words. So you have the double whammy of the interleaving and the length of the code word. So what's the vision I'm going to try to convince you of today? To focus on the engineering need, to make the math look like the engineering rather than the other way around. I want low latency. I don't want to rely on interleaving. I don't want to have to have long codes. I'm not going to really worry about capacity. I'm going to look at the highest rate available at the block length that I'm willing to give. So I'm going to fix the block length. I'm going to fix the delay. And I'm going to look at the best rate. I'm really not losing throughput because you know, we keep talking about capacity, but we keep transmitting at rates, which as I mentioned before, are sort of ridiculously below capacity. I want flexibility. I want efficient, accurate decoders for all short codes. And I don't want to be at these massively long thousand of bit codes. And even if we go to shorter codes like CA polar codes, I still in effect have ridiculously long codes because of the interleaving. And I don't want to fight the noise correlation. I want to use it. Okay. So with this, uh, with this in mind, uh, what are we going to do? Um, well, let me look at the results that are out there for uh, shorter codes. Okay, here's capacity up here. This is uh, this is uh, the very nice um, uh, set of results that uh, my colleague Yuri Polyansky at MIT has has collected. This is with hard detection. We'll go to soft detection later. Uh, but basically, what do we have here? This is capacity. This is a converse. Never mind what it is saying that you know you can never get better than this rate. Here's the code length. Okay. Uh, and these are two theoretical bounds. Again, don't, let's not worry too much about what they are, but these are theoretical bounds. These are not giving you a code construction or a feasible decoding uh, approach in order to get those bounds, okay? Uh, this is what we know here. You see, for instance, with a bit error, uh, uncoded bit error, so bit flip probability of 10 to the minus two, target block error rate of 10 to minus two here, bit error probably of 10 to minus three, target block error at 10 to minus three. It's actually a very good, uh, a very good uh, back of the envelope um, assumption, by the way, that what you're doing is you're taking the block error rate to match your bit error rate, okay? So you see these results. Uh, and that's what theory tells you. And then you look at, you know, what codes allow you to do. So let me look at classic codes like Reed Mueller, Reed Solomon. Here you go. Here are the available code lengths. They're not very many. Here are the variable rates. Sometimes there's a lot. Sometimes there's not as many. Um, here that we have a heat map. So uh, blue to, to red in terms of raising code rate. And by the way, probability of error, block error rate probably will also go up with this heat map. Uh, here are no, newer codes. This is the 3GPP 5G new radio control channel, which I mentioned. Uh, these are CRC aided uh, polars. Uh, and so you can see is it's actually, even though we have this in theory, the practice is way, way uh, off from that. Okay. Um, this is what I'm gonna show you we can do today. We can do actually better than the best achievable um, theoretical, um, theoretical bounds right now. Uh, and basically very, very close to the converse. And not at capacity, but again, who gives a hoot about capacity given that we're, you know, we keep hard talking about capacity, but we're never getting even close to that in any of the things that, that we do right now. 
Okay. So what did Shannon tell us uh, again uh, a, lo a long time ago? Well, what he told us was, uh, was the following. He said, well, uh, this is how I'm going to get to their radar. Remember that that meant that I have to do the NR uh, possible strings to transmit. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to have a, a a random choice of the code words, and then I can show you that as long as R is less than the entropy of the noise, which I denoted by H N before, uh, then I can recover. Now the problem uh, with the approach that he he did was that he said the way I'm going to do that is uh, I'm going to look at everything that was received, all the possible whys, um, and I'm going to look through uh, through the, my entire code book and pick out of the code book uh, the one that's most likely, the maximum likelihood, the maximum a posteriori, but all input distribution, uh, all input code words are the same probability because we've done the we've done the the compression. I'm going to pick the most likely out of those two to the NR. Okay, why don't we do that? Well, first of all, suppose I have the kinds of lengths that that we would uh, that we consider now for code code lengths, which is or say around a thousand bits, and say that I want to have a large R, which remember that's what I would like. I'd like to be close to capacity. Again, I want you to think of capacity as being you know 0.9 something. Um, then it would be very difficult to look through the entire code book. I can't store 10 to the 277 strings. I can't compute to 10 to the 277 strings. I can't do it, okay? So Shannon gave us a proof, which is, well, you know, send random code words and then at the receiver, look for the most likely uh, code word in your set of two the NR code words to match the why, uh, but that's not what we do. So what do we do? Instead, we construct codes, okay? And that's why we have those very restricted constructions that I showed you before. Uh, this is a very simple, you know, cartoon, and we can discuss. I put modern here in 1990s uh, because you know LDPCs, low density pair check codes, are often considered to be so-called modern codes. But you know, LDPCs have been around for longer than I have on this earth, so that they're, they're really from 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 the 60s. Um, and you know, I'm putting network codes here, but let's just, just look here at just the the channel codes. You know, really the big uh, the big um, evolution here has been polar codes. I showed you some CRC aided polar codes earlier. And that's uh, by uh, in the end of the 2000s. Okay, so what am I going to propose to you instead of using the approach uh, that was proposed by Shannon to just look at to the NR possibilities and 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 um, uh, and, and look at the the one that is most likely to to match the the output. This is what we do in grand in guessing random additive noise decoding. I'm going to guess the true noise. And sometimes I might guess the wrong noise uh, because I might guess a noise which corresponds to the difference between the true noise, uh, between the, what was transmitted and what was received. But generally I will, do, I will do well. Let me just actually go straight to this. So what do I mean by guessing the noise? I have the Y, remember, this is my output. It's of length N. Uh, I have my X, which was my code word of length N. And as we mentioned before, there's two to the NR of these. And I'm adding, and I'm putting here addition in a general sense, some noise. This is the noise effect. It could be additive. Uh, it doesn't really matter if it's exactly additive. It's invertible in some way. And we know from, uh, from source coding that there's two to the NH roughly of these with high probability this two to the NH of these. So the standard decoder identifies XN using the structure of the code book. Remember, it would be difficult when looking at YN to consider all two to the NR possibilities. So what it does is instead it sneaks structure into the code book and uses that structure at the, in the decoder at the cost, of course, of a lot of complexity, uh, at a cost of possibly reducing uh, reducing rate at a lot of cost. And of course, the cost and flexibility that we saw before, where you have, in effect, very few lengths possible, very few ends possible, and very few rates. Um, what Grand is going to do is instead we're going to use the noise. 
And what do you mean, what do I mean by using the structure of the noise? The noise is not uniform. If the noise were uniform, then 2 to the nh would be 2 to the n. This would be huge, and we wouldn't be able to transmit anything. Capacity would be zero, okay? So what I mean by the noise effect here is the following. I am going to guess from the most likely noise to the least likely noise. I'm going to subtract the effect I'm going to invert the effect of the noise that I guess, the putative noise, and I'm going to do that until I find that subtracting the effect of the noise from the received signal yn gives me something that's in the code, work, code book. Okay? I don't care what the code book was. It's universal. Okay? And the complexity here is not a function of the code rate. It's not it's not going as to the NR, it's only a function of, uh, of the noise, how much noise I have. So if my noise is low, if it has low entropy, which obviously if I have a bit flip probability of 10 to the minus three, my noise entropy is incredibly low. And even if I have a bit flip probability of 10 to the minus three, if my code, code book is, is for, uh, for noises of, uh, if my code book is of length uh, n, then 2 to the n h is basically order 1. That means, on average, I'm going to be guessing very, very quickly. Okay? So rather than looking at this part, which is what I'm interested in, but it's hard, I'm going to look at this part, which is what I'm not interested in, but is easy. Okay? I'm going to look where things are easy, and things are easy at the noise. So what do I mean by that? This is what Shannon told us to do. He told us, look at all two to the NR possibilities and uh, look at all of those possibilities until you find the most likely one. Okay, so if I have a binary symmetric channel with 10 to the minus three uh, probability of a bit flip, say ID, here's the complexity, okay, for different lengths of, uh, of uh, code books. Here's my code book rate. It's going exponentially with the code book. The complexity here is, is, in, um, uh, is in the log scale. And if instead I guess the noise, I actually don't care about the code book rate. At some point over here, actually, I start getting, and interestingly, this happens right around the cutoff, right? I actually start getting less complexity. Why do I start getting less complexity? Because sometimes when guessing the noise, I'm actually gonna guess a different code word. Okay, so here I have a scheme which is basically not becoming more difficult with code book rate. It's either unmodified in terms of complexity by code book rate, or if I'm a high enough code, code rate, it actually becomes easier. Okay, so this is what Shannon told us to do. This is what we're going to do. It's still a maximum likelihood decoder. And as a matter of fact, as, sh as I'll show you later, if I have no interleaving, uh, I in effect have more structure in the noise. The more structure I have in the noise, the faster I can, uh, I can decode. Let's go back to this evolution of codes, you know, block, convolutional, modern, all the way to polar. Um, this is what Shannon told us about. These are the, the random codes that he, he, he used in his proof. In the 1970s, it was shown by Gallagher that actually it doesn't matter whether you use random or random linear. Now, what's the difference between random and random linear? Uh, random linear means that actually it doesn't make it any easier to decode in terms of looking at two to the NR uh, code, code, book, code words. However, in terms of storing the code book, it's very easy. So I no longer need to store two to the NR uh, uh, code words. However, I still have the issue that even though I don't have to store two to the NR uh, code words, I still have a setting where uh, having to look through two to the NR code words would be difficult. So the storage difficulty that we mentioned before is obviated. Uh, the complexity in terms of having to look at two to the NR uh, code words would, would still be there. But we've gotten rid of that complexity. How did we get rid of that complexity? Well, I just told you. We're not going to look at the code books. We're going to look at the noise. So when the, what do I get in terms of code book? What can I decode? Well, of course, I can decode all the other code words I had before, classic codes, uh, new codes, like uh, polar codes with a CRC with a CRC aided uh, construction. I can decode all of those. But I can also decode the random linear codes. 
the same codes in effect that uh, that Shannon and Gallagher had told us about, except that you know Shan uh, Shannon had the problem of both the storage and the search. Gallagher had got rid of the problem of the storage by doing linear, but uh, kept the problem of the of the search. And now we've gotten rid of the problem of the storage because of uh, because of linearity, and we got rid of the problem of the search because of Grant. Okay, so all of these points that I told you we could get to, we can get to. This is random linear codes. I can get all of these codes, and not just in theory, given you know again these very complicated and and um, and uh, purely theoretical bound, achievability bounds. We're actually getting this in practice, um, and actually uh, we we just um, we have just uh, uh, received a chip back from tape out, and we have shown. Uh, with very, uh, very, very low delay and, and very good uh, energy numbers, uh, we, we have shown this. We have shown this decoding uh, on our chip. Okay, now you're going to say, well, Miro, that's fine, uh, but how do you guess uh, the noise in, in general? Usually you have soft information uh, in decoders, and you know, how do you incorporate the soft information in, uh, in the decoding? I'm not going to go into details here, but just say that there are different things that you can do. In the same way that we can do chase decoding, we can do signal reliability decoding, where we just have one bit of soft information. We can do soft decoding uh, with uh, you know, much more information. This is soft grant uh, which we just presented at ICC this past um, this this year um, but there are actually some interesting um, quantizations for for soft decoding which make this uh, make a grant uh, applicable to soft decoding it's a little bit more subtle technically so I'm not going to go into it uh, but it, it's actually uh, you hear the references and it's actually very doable uh, so basically let me show you an example here. Um, let me compare it actually to, um, you know, the state of the art, uh, which is say proposed decoders with soft information uh, for CRC aided for CA polar codes. Uh, this is uh, the Talon Barty uh, list decoding algorithm, which uh, was recently licensed by Samsung. Um, basically, what they do is uh, they use a soft decoding. Uh, uh, the soft uh, soft information to make a, a list of potential code words, and then they use the CRC to pick from that list. What we're going to do is basically we don't need to separate it into two two different uh, steps because this is just uh, a linear code. Um, so we, we, we don't need to do this two step thing. Uh, we can just put it in as a code. Remember, we don't care how the code was created. We have a universal decoder. Uh, so we have, here's the, the waveform. This wiggle here is to, to represent the waveform. We have a single step decoding uh, where we go from the demodulator and either with some uh, discrete, discretized information or with full soft information, we are able to decode. Okay. Uh, by the way, this yields some surprises. Uh, this is um, this is the list decoding that I mentioned before, the Talon Barty list decoding. This is a 128-103 CA polar code uh, from the 5G standard. Uh, one of the things that's interesting here is this is with a list size of 16, which is much better uh, really than um, than the state of the art chips right now, which usually would have a list size of of eight, although there are a few that do 32, but they, they use a huge amount of energy. Um, here you see that even the hard decoding of Grant, because it's maximum likelihood, actually does better than the state-of-the-art soft decoding. This was something of a, of a surprise uh, to us. Um, and by doing even the, the approximation that I mentioned before, the quantized approximation uh, of soft decoding with Grant, we, we outperform massively the, the state-of-the-art for an existing code. By the way, as I said, this is just a linear code. We don't need to do it in two steps. We're just using uh, the linearity of the, the code book for rapid checking of code work membership. Um, what if I use a random code? Well, a random code is uh, as good as a polar code. So, um, and by the way, this is not a random code where we went and selected over random codes. This is the first random code that the computer generates. And you can just select random codes over and over again. They will always perform at least as well uh, as the state of the art CA polar codes. Um, so again, uh, this is just a random code. Uh, this is a, uh, CA, uh, CA polar code uh, with uh, with uh, this modified version of Grant for soft information, and this is a little better than the state of the art uh, decoders out there. Um, 
basically, um, you can now, as I promised you, also look at interleaving. Uh, here's an actual channel trace. Uh, it looks anything but independent. If you interleave, again, as I mentioned before, at the cost of massive delay, um, you break up the you break up the burstiness. Um, but actually, we want to keep the burstiness. Uh, here, I'm showing you grand uh, applied to a different kind of uh, of code. Uh, this is a BCH code. This is what happens when you use a Burley Camp Massey decoder. Uh, as it gets more, bur if if I don't interleave, this is a uh, perfect interleaving Burley Camp Massey. If I don't interleave, uh, I have worse uh, behavior. If I use a Burley Camp Massey, if I do interleave, actually, I have if I have better behavior. So not interleaving will give me better behavior. What do I get here? I get a power factor of about two, uh, greater than two, for not interleaving. And I get a delay factor over 100. So I've speeded up for an existing code. I've speeded up my communications by 100 by not having to interleave. And I got myself over 3 dB uh, of EB over N0. Okay, so huge, huge gains to be had here. Uh, and this is with a CA polar code. Uh, we get a power factor of over 6 dB. And again, a delay factor over 100. Okay, so that's it. Uh, this is the new vision I'd like to convince you we should all be, be looking at. Uh, no longer making the engineering look like the math, but making the math look like the engineering and focusing on the engineering lead. Low latency, it's not interleave. Uh, don't worry about capacity. Strive for the highest rate available at sh our short block lengths. I show you that we basically, we achieve better than the best known theoretical bounds. Uh, and we're within a hair's, uh, hair's breadth of the converse. Flexibility, we can decode all short codes. We, we don't care what short code it is. It can, be a, it can be an existing code, it can be a random code, any old code will do. And robustness, don't fight the noise correlation. And for heaven's sake, don't, don't go ahead and interleave and add you know, two orders of magnitude of delay. Use it, if you have correlation, use it. Uh, and with that, I will stop and uh, take any questions, uh, take any questions from the, uh, from the audience. So I'll go to the Q&A and I'll stop the sharing. Thank you, Muriel. So uh, let's wait a few minutes for questions to come in. Thank you. So I see one uh, already um, from Forkan Urkan. Um, so it looks like grand derivatives are exciting. Can you tell the worst case latency of the grand decoding? Yeah, thank you. Um, that is a good question. And uh, let me, uh, so, so let me first tell you um, that the average latency is extremely low. Okay, very, very low. The worst case latency actually you can control. And let me go back to sharing. Maybe I shouldn't have stop sharing. Uh, I didn't mention how we handle the worst case latency, uh, but it's basically you can, um, you, you can abandon. And the abandonment means that if you're taking too long, uh, if, if, if you're taking too long to decode, what's happening is your noise is a bit wonky. And if your noise is wonky, you're getting close to making an error anyway. So we do what we call grand with abandonment, okay? Uh, this is, by the way, uh, grand with abandonment uh, where I only have one bit of soft information. Um, and you, you just stop. You basically just say, look, I only want to get, uh, I only want to, get to, uh, to a particular, to a particular uh, bit error rate. Keep guessing beyond that is, is uh, I mean, block error rate. Keep guessing beyond that is, is is uh, is not useful uh, because in any case again remember the more I guess the more likely it is that that there's a that there's been a, that there's been a an error so you just you just truncate it it turns out that you can show uh, I didn't go into details but the references are there you can show that abandoning is still capacity achieving so even though uh, you 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 put a threshold for abandonment, you can place that abandonment threshold and still get to capacity. Um, so you, you don't actually give up anything for theoretically and in practice, you, you don't give up anything. So uh, in our chip, we, 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 do, we do that abandonment. Uh, does, that answer, does that answer your question, Furkan? Yeah. 
Uh, and that is the question from uh, Hisham, Hisham of Bakuri. Hi, Hisham. Uh, is there a possibility to use Grand in 5G? Uh, I should certainly hope so. Um, because again, you can, as we showed you, you can use it with existing codes. Uh, and it's particularly good for ultra reliable, uh, low latency communications. Um, you know, uh, things like, um, of course, you know. By the way, we can we can operate with uh, with something like uh, with something like uh, uh, interleavers. I mean, uh, at bad mouth interleavers. But if you have an interleaver, fine. You know, if you can disable it, even better. Um, and so, because we can operate with existing codes, uh, I think it it definitely it can be used in five G. As a matter of fact. Um, there's there's really nothing to stop you uh, because it's usually the the encoding that is uh, that is standardized and, and not the decoding. Um, uh, Xiao Feng uh, Chi, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Why? Well, thank you. Results are exciting. Thank you. I think so too. Does Grand require explicit estimation of noise correlation statistics to take advantage of it? That's a good question. So if you don't have that noise correlation statistics. Um, then you cannot take advantage of them. However, uh, the results that I showed you, um, that I showed you with, um, uh, in, for instance, in this in this slide here, don't don't assume that you know the noise statistics. Um, and what do current decoders do? Well, what current decoders do is uh, they actually don't take into account uh, they they don't take into account the noise statistics usually. Uh, they use the interleaver. So if you don't have the noise statistics because you have an interleaved uh, signal, uh, that's fine too. Uh, so you you won't get the extra benefit. You won't get the extra benefit that I showed you at the end of yet another you know uh, between you know three to six dB gain in uh, in. Um, uh, NEB over N0, but you get all these benefits that you that I show you here, which are already big benefits uh, relative, for instance, to the state of the art, uh, because, you know, I mean, I'm getting half a dB here uh, and a huge flexibility in terms of rate. Uh, does that answer your question, Xiaofeng? Okay. Um, uh, Bob Lance is going to answer this question live. Okay, sorry. Yes, thanks. Okay, uh, next is Marcos. Marcos Tavares, what's the theoretical computational complexity of grand? Would it be feasible for larger code lengths? Yeah. Um, so the 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 average complexity is very very low, uh, and as I mentioned before, you you can stop uh, whenever whenever you want. In terms of uh, going to larger code word lengths, that's really not our purpose here. We're looking really at you know hundreds. If you have soft information, you you can do larger code words. Um, but we're not really looking to do large code words. Um, the reason for not doing large code words, uh, just to go back. Uh, just to go back to the um, uh, sorry, just just to go back to the picture. Sorry, let me just go go back to the picture that we talked about here, or maybe just to the is that I I don't need to do uh, I can get to rates with short code words that are better than the rates I have now with long code words. So why were we doing long code words right now? We were doing long code words because we thought, back from Shannon, that we had to do large code words, that we had to go to you know thousands of bits. But even with these thousands of bits, we're not, we're not transmitting to close to capacity. So if I can transmit right now with short code words at rates that are closer to capacity than what I do, than what people do currently with long code words, you know, since we're transmitting at rates where, you know, with like two thirds, three quarters, and I can get to that with short code words, why on earth would I want to go to a long code word? So these are not for long code words, uh, but the purpose is why would I even want to go to long code words? Uh, does, does that answer your question, Marcos? Yeah? All right. Um, okay, going now to Shamik. Thanks for the great talk. Thank you. Two quick questions. Question one: Could adversarial nose injection hamper the robustness of Grand? And can deep learning be better than Grand in terms of complexity? What are my thoughts? Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, so basically what would happen with adversarial uh, adversarial noise injection is that the worst thing that can happen to your noise 
uh, given that you know you, you're still sending at, at that rate, is that it would be completely uncorrelated, uh, which is basically that you had interleaving. So the worst thing that could happen to you is interleaved. And as I mentioned before, we work with, with interleaved. Okay. Now, of course, if you now you send a noise of higher entropy, well, it doesn't matter whether you're using grant or you're using anything, your rate goes down. Okay. So if you if you if your noise entropy goes up, uh, because your noise energy goes up, then you've jammed and your rate went down and that has nothing to do with grand. That's just, that's just jamming. That's just your rate went down because you, you had too much noise. Um, can deep learning be better than grand in terms of complexity? Um, what are my thoughts? Uh, I don't see it. I, I don't know that deep learning, I haven't seen deep learning um, do, for instance, arbitrary codes. This is really, really simple. Okay. I mean, when I'm talking simple, um, uh, you know, I, you know, deep learning is, is, is complex. Um, this is simple. I mean, it doesn't get simpler than this. Uh, so just in terms of, you know, just in terms of, uh, definitely, you know, uh, how, uh, how, how quickly this goes. This is extremely simple. And again, it's, it's universal. I, I don't even know how you would do deep learning decoding for an arbitrary code book. I haven't seen any, any deep learning for arbitrary code books. I've seen deep learning for co-designing code, code books and decoders. Uh, there's a lot of interesting work in co-design of code and co encoders and decoders, but this is for an arbitrary arbitrary code works code book. So I don't even know that you how you would do deep learning for an arbitrary uh, code book. Um, so uh, I don't know if that answers your question, Shemik. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to go through. Uh, Furkan has uh, one more question. Uh, what are future research directions on grant? Yeah, thank you. There, this is this are very interesting. This is a very good uh, question. Um, so uh, some of the so, some of the, um, the 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 work that we've undertaken now uh, is basically um, partially in security. You know, there's something very very exciting about being able to to be uh, completely um, uh, completely uh, free or to choose any code book and in particular to be able to decode random code books. So because we're able to decode any code book, you can also change the code books on the fly. Uh, so there's some interesting aspects there with, uh, with respect, uh, with respect to, to, to security um, that, uh, that we, we've been looking at. Um, we, we continue our, our, our work on, um, on considering you know, different approaches to, approaches to soft decoding. I haven't really told you much about how we do the soft decoding um, because um, uh, because you know that that's that's a little bit more subtle, but the, there's a lot of interesting interesting things uh, that to, to to be done there. Um, so we, we're very much continuing along the the same uh, the same uh, um, thrust, but just going more deeply into them. Uh, and uh, and again, the the hardware implementation aspects are something that they were all very very interested in. Uh, oh, I see some things in the chat. Um, uh, uh, let's see, Bob Lance, did you want to ask a question? Can I not add, oh, um, so I Bob, think you wanted to ask a He has a question that's already there on the chat. Oh, okay. Let me see. Uh, sorry, I would only been mesh. Me I'm sorry. I was, uh, I was, uh, monitoring the Q and a Bob. So let me look at your question. How is it possible to do better than the theoretical limit? We, we're not doing better than the theoretical limit. We're actually meeting the theoretical limit. Um, how, when it happens with unpredictable or rapidly varying noise, uh, if the noise is unpredictable or rapidly varying, uh, and you don't have any idea about it, that's, that's when you would have to reduce to using interleaving. And then you would go back to the worst case, which as I mentioned before is ID. How is grand used in Cosmos? Uh, I don't think it's using Cosmos. I, I'm just an invite, I'm just a guest. <laughs> I'm not a member, uh, regrettably. So um, I, I'm just a guest. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but you know, 
we can certainly we can certainly fix that in the future, right? And try to do the same thing we did in network coding in the orbit, right? So that's right, that's right. So uh, so definitely something to to look at, um, and um, th uh, yes, um, absolutely. And uh, uh, let me see. Sorry, I'm I'm looking at the chat and. Um, I think, okay. I think we're, yes. Sorry. I think I'm good. I think I'm caught up. Sorry. You, you know, it's a usual zoom of, of having to look at the chat and the Q and A. Thank you guys for these really fantastic questions. Uh, and thank you for inviting me. This is, uh, this okay, was great. Thanks. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the organizers, let me thank you formally. And it was a great talk on an uh, exciting new topic. Thank you. Okay. All right. With that, I, with that, I want to invite people to take a 10 minute break. We'll reconvene exactly at 1.05 and uh, we'll start the rest of the session, the session on uh, wireless and millimeter wave. We have six talks, so that will start at 1.05. So please come back in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Muriel. Bye.